hey, today is World Turtle Day. That's right, it is World Turtle Day. Did not realize that people were that fond of turtles, but in celebration of World Turtle Day, I'm just kidding. Oh, and the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope. Today is Wednesday, May 23rd. Happy Hump Day, everybody. Normally, Wednesdays are reserved for war games. It's War Game Wednesdays. But I don't really have any new war game uh, titles to share with you, do unboxings of. And I have not had a chance to uh, sit down and do any wargaming to kind of focus on. So what I'm going to do is today I am going to review Renegade from Victory Point Games. And this is a fairly complex game. And I am just going to kind of give an overview of the game as well as do a review. I am not going to do a playthrough because there is a lot cooking with this game. Anyhow... Do want to welcome you aboard if you've never visited before this is a very casual show this is a live stream as well so live streaming on youtube there is chat available you can uh, chime in if you want to say hello or have a question comment or if you want to know something a little more about renegade as i go through my review there is quite a bit of news today so that is pretty cool so why don't we jump right on in because there is a new entry into Lost Cities lineup of games from Thames Cosmos, and I've got the dope. Time to travel once again to distant locations, but in Lost Cities Rivals, you might find yourself running short of cash to take the trips you want. Lost Cities Rivals features gameplay familiar from other titles in the Lost Cities series. Players will collect colored expedition cards and place them in ascending order in personal expeditions, possibly placing wager cards before beginning an expedition in order to increase its value. The primary difference in this title compared to others is that you must win auctions in order to place cards in your expeditions. The card deck consists of, in each of the five colors, three wager cards, two copies of cards numbered 2 through 5, and one copy of cards numbered 6 through 10. Shuffle this deck, then divide it into four piles, keeping only one pile in front of players for the start. From a separate deck, each player is given two differently colored wager cards at the start of play. A bank of 36 coins is divided equally among the players. On a turn, you can either reveal the top card from the current pile, adding it to the display, or auction the cards on display. In the auction, you must raise or pass, and only once, Can a single person remain in the auction? Maybe that didn't make sense there. Uh, I guess maybe each person can only raise or pass once? I don't know. They pay the amount bid to the center of the table, then take any cards that they want to play and start or add to expeditions. Placing the same number in an expedition is okay. The auction winner can also place one card from the display in the box out of play. The auction winner ends their turn by adding a card to the display. When the final card of a pile is revealed, divide all the coins in the center of the table equally among all players. Then bring in a new pile to continue play. Seriously, this is the cell sheet info for this game? It's going on and on and on and on and on! I find it funny that some of these Euro games that... uh, I mean, honestly, looking at the images, it doesn't look all that complex. They go into all this detail, but then American games, which are really highly thematic, are just, you know, here's here's a paragraph to tell you about it. Strange. Anyway, Lost Cities Rivals is for two to four players, ages 10 and up, and takes about 40 minutes to play. Takes you almost as long to play as it does to read the sell sheet info. The MSRP is $14.95 and 
The game will be demoed at Gen Con, but will not be available for sale at the show, but will be arriving later in August. Eh, I don't know. Eh, Cosmos makes some cool stuff, but to me, it's like, oh, it's a Reiner Kinesia design. Right away, it's sort of like, yeah, it's going to be just rehash stuff in my book. I'm just not a Reiner Knizia fan. Anyway, the latest issue of Initiative Magazine is available for digital download. And here's the dope about issue 11. So it's April. It's actually May, but this is what it says. So it's April. And we're back with the next issue of I Am. If, like me, you are still recovering from the onslaught of chocolate that has recently occurred, no idea what that means then I invite you to spend some well-earned rest time reading through this excellent issue. We have a bit of a feast for you with the next part of our D&D slash Pathfinder adventure returning. If anyone is playing along, please let us know how it's going. Any and all feedback is most appreciated. Our cover article this month is the Gangs of Rome game. This has been written by Normski, who had the opportunity to play this recently. Two new writers make their way into the mag, with Drew providing us with some painting tips on painting faces. Gotta admit, that is probably the toughest thing to do in painting miniatures, is painting faces well, especially the eyes. There are some pretty cool tricks that you can use. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into that there. Anyway, check it out and bring some color to your cheeks. We also have a show report from Tom McCready, who visited Chilcon recently. We also have Sam Graven contributing to the ranks with a look at the Batman Miniatures game and Walking Dead All Out War by Mantic Games. This and so much more. So enough of me rabbiting on. Enjoy the mag. And as always, we appreciate your comments and feedback. You can download a copy of Initiative Magazine, which is part of the uh, figure, is it miniatures figure painting line of magazines? And it will only cost you a measly two dollars. Come on, two bucks? That's nothing. Looks pretty cool. Uh, looks like uh, I have. Um, it is miniatures figure painter. Yeah, it's miniatures figure painter, if I remember correctly. It's a magazine I used to pick up uh, at a uh, hefty price because I used to get the physical issues. And it's out of the UK, so obviously here in the US, I had to pay extra for it to pick it up at uh, a local game store that I used to go to, which is no longer around in the uh, Chicago area. All right, anyway, got some news from my pals over at Cubicle 7 because, uh, I, you know, I'm always off on how to pronounce this. All right, Pinky, enough. I'm stuck with the cats down in the duct tape studios again today, and Pinky's just going off again. I was just petting her before the show started so that she would be kind of chilled out, but nope. Of course, Smokey's down here. She's sacked out. She'll hang around. She'll mess around for a little bit. I start the show. She goes to sleep. That's what happens with good cats. Anyway, Eriador Adventures is now available in PDF for Adventures in Middle-Earth from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. And here's the dope straight from C7. Children kidnapped in the night, unusually cunning trolls, a mysterious caravan, the fate of a company of hobbits, the legacy of the Dunedain, and an evil awakening beneath the barrows. Six new stories set in the ancient land of Eriador. I think that's how it's pronounced, not positive. Six adventures that need a company of heroes to undertake them. Eriador Adventures, yes, as I've said twice already, contains six ready-to-play adventures for Adventures in Middle-Earth, complete scenarios that can be played separately or as an epic series spanning a number of years. All adventures are set in the years prior to 2977, and take place in the land surrounding Rivendell. Eriador Adventures complements the background and rules material contained in the Rivendell Region Guide. Delve into the ruins of overgrown Fornorst, 
walk amidst the cairns of the Barrow Downs and venture to the lair of the Witch King of Angmar himself, the ancient city of Karndum, if you have the courage. Iridor Adventures contains material previously released as The Ruins of the North for the One Ring role-playing game, fully converted to be compatible with Adventures in Middle-Earth and the Open Gaming License rules. The 146-page PDF is available now at DriveThruRPG for $19.99. The physical edition is not available just yet. I do recall Cubicle 7 was taking pre-orders for it, though. But usually their print editions take a bit of time. So I'm taking a guess that we might see that one maybe July. I'm guessing maybe July. We'll find out, uh, but it shouldn't be too far off. And of course, the PDF is available right now, so you can go snag it. All right, speaking of some pretty cool role-playing game stuff, Modifius Entertainment and Metal Weave Games are combining the first and second volumes of the Baby Bestiary into a collector's edition. And here's the dope from Modifius. Today, we're really pleased to announce the release of Volumes 1 and 2 of Metal Weave Publishing's awesome Baby Bestiary, plus PDF releases of the same, which join the existing Collector's Edition. Discover the adorable in a world of myth and magic. Great heroes vanquish terrible monsters and earn a place in legend. Well, what about the babies left behind? These books are the first exploration of a new kind of adventure, the raising of young monsters to become loyal companions, beloved friends, or fearsome guardians. If you are looking for something novel to spice up a fantasy role-playing campaign, or simply want to see a different side to the creatures of fantasy art, the Baby Beast series books have all the monstrous cuteness you could want, and probably stand. Animal Aficionados Originally funded by hundreds of aficionados of Animal Affection on Kickstarter, these books join the Baby Bestiary calendar in a new line of products by Metal Weave Games. The Baby Bestiary handbook will add some awe to your coffee table ornaments and squee! I kind of put an exclamation on that that's not really in the press release. To your players squelching through dank dungeons. The Baby Bestiary is also available in a collector's edition, which contains volumes 1 and 2 in a hardcover sleeve. The physical collector's edition carries an MSRP of $67.99, or you can score volumes 1 and 2 separately in PDF on DriveThruRPG at sale prices right now of $12.99 and $15.99, respectively. I have got to say... The artwork from these books is awesome. I love the artwork that I've seen so far from the Baby Beast series. And it is pretty cool if you could kind of um, include you know, these into your fantasy role-playing games. Now, not necessarily everybody ends up getting their own, like, you know, like, baby griffin or something like that but i do think it's it's pretty cool and maybe even it could be like your whole adventuring party takes on the parenting role of a baby monster so very very nice the artwork is stunning it really is and uh even if you just wanted it for the art not even for the gaming material it looks pretty pretty enticing all right, so I don't always talk about games. I do talk about various other geek culture <laughs> things from time to time. And I do want to point out animation fans of all ages will probably want to take note that there are two series coming in 2019 to Boomerang's streaming offering. And I've got the dope. Warner Brothers Animation happened to be developing two new animated series. One based on Scooby-Doo and the other based on the Flintstones, according to The Hollywood Reporter. Both shows are scheduled to premiere in 2019 on the Boomerang streaming service. 
It's going to be Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, which pairs the iconic dog and the gang with the old mystery machine with a variety of guest stars, including it's a pretty bizarre listing. Chris Paul, Ricky Gervais, Kenan Thompson, Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Mark Hamill, and the duo of Halsey and Sia. I do not know who that duo is. Sorry. Musical duo? Because I thought, isn't she an, isn't she a singer? Isn't Sia or Saya or however it's pronounced? I thought she's a singer. Anyway, fictional characters. <laughs> I have an easier time with fictional ones. Such as The Flash, Wonder Woman, and Sherlock Holmes are also scheduled to appear. Show, the show will be produced by Chris Bailey and Sam Register. That really is their name, Sam Register. Then there's Yabba Dabba Dinosaurs, and it will focus on the Flintstones Pebbles, Bam Bam, and Dino. This 15-minute show will feature the two children investigating Bedrock and its surrounding area. So they're not going to be babies. They're not going to be teens. I guess it's going to be in between. Aha. Uh -huh. Mark Merrick, Marley, Halpern, Grazer, and Sam Register. Yes, there's Sam again. Will be producing this show. And of course, as I mentioned previously, this will only be available through the Boomerang streaming service. I have to point out, I do not like the artwork that they're displaying here for Scooby-Doo. Uh, first of all, it's got a real kind of family guy vibe to it. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. A family guy is family guy. Scooby-Doo should be something different and you shouldn't have kind of an overlap of that, that animation style. So it's kind of a cross between uh, family guy and then the really crappy Nickelodeon style of animation, which I know there are people who are like, oh, I love Rugrats. Rugrats was a great show. Whatever. Nickelodeon had this real cheap ass animation style that uh, never liked, never cared for. And then all of a sudden, all these other shows started picking up on it. And it was like, there goes the art of animation again. Not to say Hanna-Barbera cartoons back in the day were fantastically animated. Hey, Andrew Barbier is popping in to say hello on chat. Hey there, Drew. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, I don't know. Our style's not looking too hot. But, hey, at least there's a, there's going to be a new Scooby-Doo show. And it'll be streaming, and you'll have to pay for the subscription, but, hey. All right, so, my final news piece is about something that has uh, Games Workshop fans... Pretty much, excuse my French here, but um, they're kind of losing their shit. And I'm talking, they're losing their minds, and not, not in a good way, about these Warhammer adventures, which are coming in 2019. Got a little bit of dope about them, and uh, I'll explain what they are. Warhammer Adventures is a series of action-packed stories about brave heroes battling monstrous enemies and winning great victories against impossible odds in the far future universe of, four, of Warhammer 40,000, or I guess I should say Warhammer 40K, and the fantasy realms of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Warhammer adventure stories are perfect for bookworms aged 8 to 12 who want to read about heroes, aliens, and monsters. They'll be in shops and online in 2019, so keep your eyes open for them. Okay, so the reason why all these fans of Games Workshop are going nuts is because it's like the Disneyfication of their beloved games, Warhammer 40K, and, well, I used to call it just Warhammer Fantasy, but now it's Warhammer Age of Sigmar, and it has been for a while. So I have heard through the grapevine that there had been a schism behind the scenes at Games Workshop between two factions. One faction that continues, that they just want to continue to produce that same grim, dark kind of setting. And another faction who understands that Games Workshop has lost a lot of market share to a lot of other wargaming companies. Now, don't 
don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're going out of business, they're broke, but they aren't making the kind of money that they once did. If, you're, if you live in the U.S., just think of how many uh, Games Workshop stores popped up all around the country. I think in the Chicago area, there used to be three, maybe four. Now there's zero. I'm almost positive. I think there might be one floating around. I think there's still a few floating around in the U.S., but the vast majority of them are gone. And uh, this uh, the second faction really wants to kind of lighten up the settings and bring in a lot of youth to the settings. So uh, I don't know. Personally, I don't have a dog in the fight, so it doesn't really matter to me. I do think it's very bizarre uh, that suddenly we would be seeing, and even just the artwork is very very comic book, uh, very kind of Disney-esque in some ways. Uh, and it's got, I mean, we're talking like, it's showing like little kids in the Warhammer 40K and Age of Sigmar uh, setting. So kind of bizarre. I don't know. I don't know how young the kids really get into Warhammer stuff in the UK. Now, I have to admit now, when my nephew was about 12 years old, I think one of his friends from school was starting to get into it, uh, probably through like an older brother or parent or something. And uh, my sister-in-law was like, oh yeah, Cameron's been talking about, you know, this Warhammer game. And I was like, absolutely not, do not get into it. Not that it isn't good. It was sort of like, uh, you do not want to jump into that money sink. You really don't. Anyway, so pretty strange. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, uh, what, what's going on with Games Workshop? But uh, there had been some folks behind the scenes at Games Workshop who were kind of leaking this info over the past few months that uh, that longtime gamers were not going to be pleased to see this new direction coming for Games Workshop. And everybody's like, yeah, no, that ain't true. That's not going on. All right, so anywho, usually at this point in time, I would tell you, hey, so this is what's coming up on the show for the week, for the rest of the week. I still don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I do have that weird gaming chair that's supposed to be arriving today by FedEx. Uh, I might shoot a little bit of video and kind of share that, see how easy it is to put together and stuff. Because uh, Ewin Racing chairs are actually going to be a sponsor of the show for, uh, for a week or two. So they did send me one of their uh, $400 gaming chairs to uh, check out and to enjoy and to lounge around in. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I had mentioned that on yesterday's show. Uh, and I did start playing around with Fantasy Grounds last night as far as, because uh, I mean, there's, I don't, I don't want to say it's a skeep, a skeep, duh, steep learning curve they're saying steep and curve like in one word it's esperanto that's how i that's how i do it i just combine I'm, i combine a couple of words just to make it quicker and this uh is scurve so uh i don't want to say it's got a steep learning curve but there's a lot to it so i was messing around playing around and uh i might I don't know. I might actually open up our campaign that we're going to do to uh, maybe a couple of viewers to get into the group. Don't know for sure yet. Maybe one or two. So, uh, because so far it's looking like I'll do the game mastering. Uh, my nephew Cameron, Elliot Miller, my best friend, of course. Probably my friend Ed, who was part of our role playing group years and years ago uh, when we were in our teens and 20s as well as possibly Elliot's wife so I was thinking maybe a party of six so I might actually open it up to a lucky viewer who wants to take part in uh, uh, in the, the uh, Fantasy Grounds <laughs> campaign I'm going to do I, I, I'm, I'm thinking now to show off to show it off I'm probably going to go with Call of Cthulhu 7th edition but I think to play, I'm probably going to go with Dungeons and Dragons because 
I want to do some, I want to do some kind of over the top fantasy stuff. I really do. All right. So anyway, so uh, eh, more about that later. But uh, tomorrow I'll have some sort of RPG thing. I've got like two or three different releases that I've been poking my nose in. All I got to really do is probably finish them up, finish one of them up tonight and uh, do a review. But I will have that out. Um, uh, I'll have that out tonight so people know what's going to be on the show. Friday show is still up in the air. Not sure about the camp. I know we're going camping. I don't know when we're supposed to be going camping. And I'm going to get to do some, uh, going to bring some games with and uh, might even do a little game mastering uh, around the campfire or something. So, anywho, as I pointed out, today I'm going to do a review of Renegade from Victory Point Games. And it, uh, it's their most recent game that just came out. It's designed by Richard Wilkins with art provided by Clark Miller. Game is for one to five players, ages 14 and up. Plays in around 60 minutes. I'd say it's a little longer than that. And does carry an MSRP of $45. So let's pop on over to the other camera. I've got some stuff set up. Let me get this box out of the way. Uh, first thing I'm going to point out is that I am just going to kind of give an overview of this game and my thoughts on the game. I am not going to go through a lot of the gameplay elements. Uh, I'm not going to do a playthrough of the game at all. Uh, this game did kickstart, so there are different um, different videos out there as far as uh, how to plays and playthroughs and things like that. So that already exists out there. That's already out there, plenty of it. So I don't want to just, you know, rehash what, what a lot of people probably already seen. So the premise of Renegade is that it's the future. There's this supercomputer called Mother that is... Uh, essentially kind of taking over the human race. So uh, it's mainly, it's it's taking place, it's starting uh, in Japan. Japan is the main, uh, I guess we'll say like, like patient zero would be, that's where the outbreak is starting off. And of course, citizens are giving away their, you know, sacrificing their individuality so that there's uh, there's no crime, there's no hunger, there's no want, but there's also no freedom, no freedom of expression, things like that. So it's a dystopian future. It's a cyberpunkish future. It would fit in easily enough into uh, William Gibson's lineup of books, like Neuromancer, things like that. So um, each of the players are going to represent a hacker, a renegade who is fighting against the computer. But the cool thing about Renegade is that there are various different computers that you can do battle with in the game. You're not just going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mother, so you've got a lot of variety in this game. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that the game is for ages 14 and up. Now, normally when I see a game that says, oh, it's for 14 and up, the first thing my assumption is it's 14 and up because of the components, because there are small pieces that somebody could swallow. Child could swallow these. Kids can swallow, whoops, swallow dice. It can happen. So a lot of times you'll see, okay, so it's recommended for ages 14 and up, especially games in the United States too. 14 and up because of the components, not because of the gameplay not because of the complexity of the game. In this game, I would say, yeah, 14 and up. <laughs> I'm not talking because of the, uh, I'm not talking about because of the components could be a health hazard. This is the rule book for Renegade. Now, it's, the game is not necessarily overly complex once you get your head wrapped around it. The problem is wrapping your head around the game. So we're going to see there's a component overview here. And we've got these various different tokens, which all represent, these counters represent different things. They represent infections, they wreck, uh, or I should say viruses, data nodes, 
upload points, root kits. So we've got talking about setup, glossary of terms. You don't run across a whole lot of board games uh, that are like, oh, okay, so here's a glossary of terms. Usually, when you see a glossary of terms, you know the game is going to be relatively complex. Now, that doesn't make this a bad game. It just doesn't make it a game that you're going to bust out with, like, you know, your 11-year-old daughter or son or someone who's into really light games, casual games. It talks about winning and losing, sequence of play. It's an example here. New spark step. All right, so just as I mentioned, going through these rules here. So there are quite a few rules of 20 pages and there are illustrations, but there are still quite a lot of rules in here. I talked about the different renegades. Then you've got a walkthrough. Pretty detailed walkthrough, lots of examples as well. Okay, so so this is considered to be the the like the neural net, right? This is this is where the hackers are going to attack the computer system. So each of these are considered to be a server, and each of these servers have different names. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they just do. They have different names. So there's you know like like faith. Faith is one of the servers. So you'll notice that each of the renegades, each of these hackers, also have a color. So they are color coded, and each of the hackers has a card. There's a color-coded card. So we've got the primary renegade and then we've got an alternate renegade. And you're going to see here, this also is your player aid card. So there's a key code up top, then you got your actions list, and it talks about the special ability that this hacker has. Then we've got some flavor text down here. But if you take a look, look at these, like looking at the actions, it's kind of like, wow. Uh, one of the first things that most of the players, okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be very, very honest. So most of the time when I'm playing games for review, the the people I end up playing with are gonna be my nephew Cameron, sometimes my brother Greg, my older brother Greg. Uh, every once in a while, my my niece. So uh, Cameron's 16. My brother's older than I am, so obviously he's older than 50, so it's not like he's like, huh? Uh, my my niece Madison is 12. So, uh, and then of course, can be Cameron's high school friends, could be my best friend Elliot Miller swings over. But to play Renegade, I had, uh, it was Cameron and his friends uh, who come over who are all high school age. And I'm going to point out, they dislike this game intensely. They did not care for this game whatsoever. I, on the other hand, I like the game, but the game also has some, some issues. So anyway, so uh, I just want to kind of be right up front because looking at this, okay, so these are the different actions available. Once the players looked at that. Once they saw that, their eyes started to just glaze over. It's like, huh? What? Move? Shift, upload, modify, install, infect, execute, shop. Those are the available actions. But the way it's presented, see, the 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 kind of the main issue that I have with Renegades that Renegade, I should say, that makes it more difficult in my opinion to learn how to play because in my as far as I'm concerned you should be able to go pick up a rule book for a game read through it now granted I'm not saying that you read through it one time and you understand how to play it you may have to go back over it or kind of play a little bit solitaire to kind of get a feel for it 
but you should be able to read through the rule book a couple of times and have a pretty good understanding of how to play this game. Renegade just, just doesn't, it's not intuitive. I'm not saying it's badly presented. I'm just saying it's not intuitive. There's a lot of extra jargon and uh, technical terms that are added into this that where I can I can understand that it's there for the flavor because it is supposed to be a cyberpunkish dive into a computer network by the hackers. These are their avatars as are in here uh, trying to defeat these various different partitions, uh, these servers, these partitions in each server. That's what each of these hexes are considered is a partition. Um, it's just all this jargon thrown in there just makes it harder to understand what's going on. So anyway, the main gist of this game is that it is a deck building game that has elements of pick up and deliver. That's really what it boils down to. So each of the players based on the color uh, the hacker that they pick, they are going to get a 15 card deck. And the 15 cards are going to be different. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, pretty basic. They're not, they're not as basic as a lot of deck building games might be. So usually most of your deck builders, you'll start off with a 10 card uh, starter deck, which is kind of garbage, but it's just to get you started. You're, you're supposed to burn those cards out. You're supposed to call that deck out to trim it down. So it's a it's a you know lean, mean fighting machine, right? With most most deck builders. Well, in this case here, you're gonna get a deck of 15 cards to start off with. And they're going to be different. So that's one aspect that I thought was kind of cool about Renegade is that every player is going to have a different specialty, kind of in what they what they focus on because this is a cooperative game. Nobody's, the, the hackers are all working together to take down these computers. You're not, you're, not, uh, you're not going it alone. So a lot of times one, one hacker will start something that another hacker is actually gonna have to pick up the ball and run with it on their turn. So there's a lot of cooperation. As I mentioned, there's a, there's a move, uh, pick up and deliver, I should say, mechanic involved in it so you might have one of the hackers creating a virus and then getting it so far and then another player picks up that virus and moves it along to another partition on a server where that needs to go so anyway so you're gonna have each of the players will have a basic card deck and it's the 15 different cards but like i said you're gonna have a variety of different cards. So the yellow player, so there we go, as an example. So we've got the yellow player and you'll be able to tell whose deck it is by this icon down here. It's gonna show you the colors. So these are the cards that start off their deck and it'll tell you, okay, so this is what that, that card gives you. Focus, bypass, data steal, data scan, decrypt. And these symbols here are all, they correspond to like here. So like, this is kind of like an entry point. If you have this here and one here, you can move between these, these nodes, right? So you can move one and automatically go there. So you're kind of, you know, this is one of the things that you're spreading around in the server that's going to help you move around. You'll notice that these servers are also color coded. So this is, these are where your hackers will appear. This is what's, what's considered kind of like their, their home server, their base server. So anyway, so you're going to have these cards. So effectively it's going to tell you, okay, what are these things good for? And there's really no text on these. The artwork's pretty cool, but I'm kind of surprised the artwork's really small on the card. 
They could have really made that artwork pop. A little surprised by that. Uh, usually, VPG is much better with their um, visual presentation. But as you can see, I mean, that's there's a lot of empty space on this card. They could have easily made that artwork a lot bigger and made this section down here smaller. Made this area up here smaller. Anyway, well, I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't affect the game, but I said, you know, the artwork's pretty cool. Why not show it off? Anyway, so memory steal. So each of the players are going to have their deck. Then you're going to have advanced cards which you can purchase. So this is another aspect I thought was kind of cool. So it's it's like a typical marketplace, right? Just like in, in most deck building games, kind of a marketplace. But what you end up doing is you'll actually, your, your deck never goes more than 15 cards. So when you purchase something from the Hack Shack, is what it's called. Uh, when I first read that, the first thing that popped in my head was uh, back uh, as a Bulls fan during Jordan's run, uh, Hack, Hack a Shack, right? Shaquille O'Neal be going for a basket. Boom! Just just follow him. Hack Shack. Everybody did that. That was that was kind of the uh, the strategy to stop Shaq because Shaq, Shaq was terrible at free throw shooting. About fifty percent is what he would make. All right. So anyway, so you can spend these cards, these symbols, to purchase these advanced cards. So these are basic cards, and I'll tell you right there. It says it's basic right above these icons. And then you'll see here, it'll say, okay, so this is advanced. This is the advanced card. It's gonna tell you what's it cost to buy, right? So you could use, instead of generating one of these entry points, you could spend that card to actually buy this card. So you're going to have, uh, once again, this is what the card does, but these advanced cards, will almost all have some written text at the bottom to give them kind of a, a, a special ability, almost like a multi-purpose. Because some are either or, some are also. So for an example, you're gonna be able to get that, utilize that icon, and then you get that as well. It says, okay, so you get to do that. This one is an either or, but uh, it's pretty cool. And there are quite a few of these advanced cards, which are, just randomly mixed up. Just randomly, completely mixed up. So, as I had mentioned before, we've got different computers. You're not just going up against Mother. So there's also, they're the SMCs, and they have different, uh, different difficulty levels. So this one here is specifically a tutorial computer that you're going to try to take down and you can tell what the the um, difficulty is going to be by these little skull, skull crossbones here. So this is the easy one. Just going to tell you about it. And then you're going to have what I thought was kind of cool were these objectives. So you're going to you have for most of the uh, for most of the computers you're taking down, they have three objectives. One copper, one silver, one gold. Silver and gold, silver and gold. No, I'm no Burl Bur Ives. So, okay, so there's Mother. Mother's mother's the, the big baddie. That is the big challenging computer that you want to try to take down. But they've got, as you can see, five in total, including the one that's for the tutorial, the RS-20 simulator. But it'll tell you how you're going to actually kind of set up the server here, the servers, and uh, you'll have things like sparks, you've got flares, you've got guardians, uh, here we go, you've got the guardians, and what these are, these are countermeasures. These are countermeasures that the computer is taking against the hackers. So you spend uh, quite a bit of time trying to, to take out these sparks, make sure you get rid of these sparks, as well as getting rid of the guardians. Now, with these, uh, uh, with these different computers, 
you've got these objectives. And it'll tell you on the SMC card how many objectives are you going to have for the game. So outside of Mother, it's all always three. And you shuffle these up by color and you don't look at them. You don't, you don't look to see what it is and you stack, take the gold, put a silver on top, put a copper on top of that. And now you're like, okay, so this is what we need to do. The interesting thing, and I, I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing, is that you can win the game by not completing these objectives. The whole whole process of the game is if you can go through three full, uh, well, nine actually, because you, you get 15 cards in your deck when you go through your 15 cards, so effectively three rounds of the game, you have to have been able to defeat or achieve this objective. If not, then you fail. Now these, this is just right here. This is your simulation. So you're going to say, okay, so did we fail or did we succeed? And you're going to, Take the text there and you're going to do what it tells you either if you had success or if you failed. It's possible to fail all of your objectives and win the game because the whole premise is that you will go through these three stages, th these three objectives. You got three rounds to take care of that, three rounds to take care of that, three rounds to take care of that. So you're actually going to go through your deck. That's why I started to say the three. You're going to go through your full deck three times during the game. Uh, because there, there is a... That's the timing mechanism, basically. Uh, so if you can survive, if your hackers can survive, and the uh, you're not overrun by the sparks and the guardians, things like that, you win. Now, there is a variety of victory styles. So it talks about your winning score, right? So if you are able to succeed on the... Oh, I put gold up on top. Duh. Silly. There's the copper. So if you were to succeed with the copper... Uh, objective, you're going to get a 25 victory point token. You can also get 25 for the... No, oh, that was silver. Duh. That's silver. There's the copper. And there's the gold. You also get victory points for taking out the guardians that may be generated across the network. So... Uh, you can still, you win the game if you survive. It's just how well did you win the game is based on your victory point total. Uh, and I don't know, to me, it's it's sort of weird that you can fail all your objectives, but still win because you survive. Your avatars survive being in this neural net. All right, so anyway, so as I mentioned, you're going to, you're going to sit there. You're going to have your 15-card deck. You're going to eventually be replacing the basic cards with much more powerful cards. Uh, one of the cool things I do like about these objectives, even though you can ignore them, is that uh, sometimes they kind of tie together pretty cool, and other times it's sort of like, holy cow, man, I, I've kind of created my deck to deal with this kind of uh, problem now we've got to do something totally different for our next objective. Now I got to tear this deck apart and hope that we get cards that we can utilize out of the hack shack. So anyway, so you've got all these various different items at your disposal. You've got see, and, and this was one of the things that that makes it kind of difficult to to learn how to play this game just as kind of a, a like 
not having somebody teach you teach you this game is you've got a variety of these different kind of tokens that do different things but they're not all that different uh so it's kind of like okay so uh so okay so that's a virus what does the virus do that's a tool that's a uh, root kit okay so what am i supposed to do with that and of course they are kind of color coded to the hackers who tend to be able to uh, deal with those threats or create like viruses, things like that. They're more apt. So for an example, this character here is more apt to be able to uh, create viruses, do things like that. So anyway, so uh, what eventually will happen is if you have because what will happen with these sparks is these sparks will create these guardians. And once you get to the point where it's kind of like a cascading, kind of like, kind of like a cascading uh, waterfall of doom. As, uh, as you don't take care of these various different sparks that are popping up, these countermeasures, really, that are popping up on the net the harder it's going to be for you to actually be able to take care of your objectives, which, as I mentioned, you don't necessarily have to to win the game, as well as be able to survive. So there there can be a point where the, uh, the computer system has basically just overwhelmed you and you're out of the game. So uh, that really kind of in a nutshell is sort of it you'll you'll actually thought this was kind of cool you'll actually create when you randomly create sparks popping up because like i said if you if you can't take care of these sparks that keep coming up you're gonna be in trouble uh and then of course it's basically if you're supposed to be putting another one of these tokens out here but there aren't any left because you can have more than one of these in a partition if you're trying to put another one of these out there if you're forced to put another one of these out there and you can't boom it's game over that's basically where it's, you're kind of like oh well but you know you can fall into a, a thing where you're going to see these spreading out more and more and more and you're putting more out there but i thought it was kind of cool there's a color-coded die as well as a uh it's a six-sided die but it's kind of got the like uh, LED numbers on it. For if you, when you're creating the random sparks, you're gonna roll these dice. It's gonna tell you, okay. So, like say for an example, that would be right there. If you roll the two, boom. Uh, something else I should point out as far as this uh, network here is that these tiles. Luckily, you don't have to like put all of these hexes together. Uh, these tiles are one piece. But you also have to make sure that the numbers are all facing the proper direction and that when you're putting together the network that at least two hex sides connect. Now, there's sometimes that you'll be faced with uh, one of the, the computers that you might want to have, you might want to try to put together areas where you've got openings between like that, right? Because uh, this is considered a closed partition like this. Well, no, I should say like uh, that, ah, where you, you have a hex on every side but then you have this is considered an open partition because there's an, there's empty hex sides to it, and uh, sometimes because you'll you'll actually put the network together. So if you're playing multiple players, first player is going to put one down, the next player is going to put one down, next player is going to put one down. But you're all gonna, already going to know which of the computers you're going to be taking on, so you can try to put together the network to to help you out. There's a lot of little things going on in this game that uh, I'll be the first to admit I have not figured out yet. There's nuances to this game that I have not played this enough to understand. 
I'm the first one to point that out. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the game was... There, there were nuances that part of the gang were like, they didn't want to deal with. So, uh, unfortunately, I had to play the last couple of games solitaire uh, in with the uh, as a simulation. And I have a good grasp of the game, but there's, there's loads of things going on with this game that I know I have not completely wrapped my head around yet. But that's good. That's cool. All right. So anyway, so that pretty much, in essence, is Renegades. You're, you're building a deck. You're trying to deal with different countermeasures that are being utilized against your hackers while also trying to uh, place your own various different attacks, attack programs, really, into the network, uh, as well as you're trying to hopefully complete some of these objectives. And then uh, there's also, like I said, there's a, a, a big element of pickup and delivery because as you create items, like say for an example, it's a replicant there, you can pick that up and take it with you. Let's say for an example, maybe it had to be over here you would hope that you have another player who can pick that up and take it along the rest of the way. Like I said, there's a cooperative aspect to the game uh, that you've got to involve yourselves in. Otherwise, you're not even going to come close to winning the game because you're never going to have it. And, and this is kind of a victory point games thing. Uh, it's famous from their, uh, their States of Siege line of games where... Uh, Chaos is always king in in Victory Point games. There's randomness here, but it's not crazy, insane randomness. Uh, you feel that you do have some control over what's going on uh, as you play. It's not just <clears throat> completely random card draws. Now, granted, yeah, you're drawing five cards to make your hand every turn, but um, but it's not like it's not like you're sitting there going, "Well, I never have a chance with this game because." I keep rolling bad dice. No, that doesn't happen. That's not the case. But as I started to say, Victory Point Games likes to have uh, games where you, when when you're playing, you never have enough action points or you never have enough time, you never have enough opportunities to do what you need to do, right? So you have to, you have to balance doing different things. Okay, so <clears throat> I know I need to get these three things done, but I, I can only possibly achieve two of them. Uh, what am I gonna what am I gonna do? Which which are the which are the most two important in this game that I need to take care of? And yes, this is another one of those kind of designs from Victory Point Games. Even though it's not like a states of siege kind of game, it is a game where you you feel like you never have enough uh, actions or movement that uh, as opposed to what you would really need. So, all right. So anyway, as far as Renegade, what do I think? Well, as I pointed out before, there are still some nuances to this game that I have not completely wrapped my head around. And mainly because of the, the, the gang. Uh, the folks I was playing with uh, really disliked it. And, and, it's pretty tough when you've got a game that, you know, people don't don't want to play and it, it's it's too overwhelming for them, which it's not really that overwhelming. It just like I said, when you start looking at, you know, there's there's the available actions list. And it, and it's just, you know, it's kind of like, what? There's all these little different icons, things like that. It can be very confusing, especially for people who like to play games where it's just, okay, you know, I uh, roll some dice, I beat up on stuff, or I'm, I, you know, I play, I play a deck building game where it's like, okay, it's so like, you know, Clank. Clank is definitely not a difficult game to figure out, right? This is, this is, this is a, like I said, this is a tougher game to wrap your head around, and the rules don't necessarily help, and all the terminology doesn't necessarily help. That said. It's a cool game. Uh, I like the I like the mix. It's it's a weird mix 
a deck building game and pickup and delivery. <laughs> so it's sort of like you wouldn't you wouldn't usually think of that. Now the uh, I dig the background, the kind of you know the story to it, the theme of it, you know cyberpunk. But then again, I grew up with you know William Gibson and Bruce Sterling stories and things like that. I read a lot of that stuff. Uh, some folks aren't into that. Some people won't dig the fact that it's like, oh, so it's kind of like, uh, it's not, you know, not even like the Matrix, right? Because, you know, although those are like really avatars. <laughs> yeah, like Avatar, right? They're avatars and Avatar. Uh, they won't, they won't dig the whole process of, oh, well, you know, you're, you're jacked into a computer and, and things like that. Some folks won't dig that. They're, they're just not into it. Other folks will be like, man, that's totally cool. I will say that if you've got the right group, you got a light group, right group who, who doesn't mind kind of, you know, a little meatier experience, then I think you're really going to like Renegade. Uh, I will point out, it said 60 minute playing time. Nah, uh, maybe 90. Learning how to play, it's probably going to be even longer than 90 minutes. But all in all, uh, Renegade's a good game. I'm still, like I said, I am still figuring it out. Uh, but I can tell you that the more I play it, I, and I really want to play with you know more than myself. Now, the first game we got we got kind of through it, and you know the other three players were like, no, no, you know, don't, we're not playing this again. We're done. Uh, they humored me enough to play it the first time. And then the next two times I had to play it solitaire. So there are still the aspects of two player, you know, two or more players that I really want to kind of, you know, get a better grasp of because I'm not very good at playing like schizophrenic. I have a very hard time if I take like a game that's for three players. I can't, or even two players, I can't, I can't play both sides. I have a hard time playing both sides. I can't disassociate myself enough to be like, oh, well, I'm the second player now. I, I have a hard time with it. But anyway, uh, I think it's very cool. I like the way the uh, the deck building, I like how you're building the deck, but you're also still discarding cards. You're always going to have the 15. I get a kick out of how, you know, you're going to draw five cards and you're going to basically be able to go through your deck one time. Not completely, maybe. It all depends. Uh, but you have the, the timing mechanism on the different objectives. I thought that's pretty cool. I like the fact that there's all these different computers too. So you got, there's tons of these objective cards. There's loads of these objective cards. I think there's maybe like eight of each color. So a lot of variety, a lot of different stuff going on and a lot of different, the different computers and the different objectives of the three different levels really, really adds tons of replayability to the game. Uh, there is luck involved because, of course, it's a deck building game, so you're drawing cards from your deck, but it's not horrible. Uh, it's not, as I mentioned before, you don't feel like, you know, because there are some games, of course, obviously, you play and it's a lot of dice rolling, and you roll bad dice, you're normally going to lose, right? This isn't one of those kind of games. So, uh, all in all, I give Renegade... Even though I feel it's kind of incomplete as far as my opinion of it, uh, I give Renegade an 8 out of 10. I think the more I understand the nuances of the design, I would probably rate it a bit higher. Uh, I like the components. The artwork's cool. Um, thing I didn't like was, you know, as far as, like, it's cool artwork, but... It's like, it should be bigger on the card. It's a lot of empty space. This is not so, this isn't so bad because it's, it's the, uh, it's one of the advanced cards, but these basic cards, it's kind of like, yeah, it would have been nice to see the artwork featured a little more prominently on the cards. Uh, and, you know, outside of that, just a little bit of the complexity to the rules. I think the rules could have been presented or I think the terminology alongside the rules could be presented differently to make it a much easier game to come to grips with. Uh, but 
still pretty good. I would not recommend it for the casual gaming crowd. I would not recommend it for people who are sitting there and they're like, oh, I can't play a game if it takes more than 60 minutes. No way. Uh, I would not. Um, cyberpunk fans should dig it. Uh, it's got a cool little backstory. It's got a lot of variety to it. So once again, I give Renegades an 8 out of 10 as far as my score. And like I said, I, I need to play it a bit more, but I need to play it with with other players as opposed to solitaire. All right, so that is it for today's show. Remember, when you're not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill by now. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I'll be back tomorrow, even though I'm not really sure what I'm, <laughs> what I'm covering. <laughs> But I'll be here, I swear. Well, knock on wood, I'll be here. You never know. Anyway, until then, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.